Welcome to Brave Healer Productions. We are waking the world up to what's possible for healing, one brave word at a time. Welcome everyone. I'm Laura DeFranco, the CEO of Brave Healer Productions, where we have a mission to wake the world up to what's possible for healing one brave word at a time. And here today to help me with that mission are some of the amazing authors of a new book that we have coming out. This one is Holistic Mental Health Volume 2, Calm, Clear, and In Control for the Rest of Your Life. Humongous thank you to Laura Mazzotta. She is our lead author of this project and the reason we are together today, doing the second book in the Holistic Mental Health series. Laura, I'm so grateful to you for your big mission and your vision for this and just who you are and what you're doing in the world the stellar author cast you brought together to talk about this very important topic. So thank you so much for just doing this with me. I know that the your fellow co-authors here feel the same about you. You're an amazing woman. And I have some pretty cool and powerful, amazing people in my Zoom room today, you guys. Let me tell you about them. Andrea Paquette is an expert in child mental health who helps her clients manage their emotions and discover their true selves through holistic and natural treatments. Marie Kalatung is thriving after a devastating diagnosis and wants to encourage people to never give Casey Muse, a renowned public speaker in drumming therapy, tailors interventions and specialized programs for diverse individuals, including neurodivergent, elderly with dementia, those with physical limitations, and for early childhood education. Casey also mentors young men, empowering personal growth. And with expertise and compassion, he remains a respected figure in drumming therapy and beyond. And I have Jessica Preston with me. She combines over 20 years in conventional and functional medicine, infertility, and women's health using evidence-based practices, founded De Novo Fertility, offering solutions for infertility through combining these practices for the one in five couples struggling to conceive. Welcome, you guys. This is going to be an awesome conversation. Andrea, I'm starting the party with you. Tell us about your amazing chapter. Well, I wrote chapter five called People Pleaser No More, How to Say No and When to Say Yes. And I wrote that because mainly I was a people pleaser from early childhood. And often that's where it starts. And I work with children almost almost all all the time they're they're my major body of clients um, but i also work with their parents and i coach women and and we i see it in the moms and i see it in the kids and it, it's much more insidious than we know and and we think it's just you know saying yes too often and and getting overwhelmed with commitments but it's not that it, it's it, that's that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. So I wrote the chapter to show people the big iceberg underneath the water and and how this all develops in people and how we can get out of it. What do you see in a kid? What's like one of the flags for you that you know this is an issue? And then I've got a follow up question that goes something like, why is this important? Like, what can it lead to? Yeah, the kids come in with a lot of insecurity and anxiety because they're usually in a household that is disorganized or just not able to meet their needs very well. And so we learn, this is what I learned as as a child and it's a it's a coping mechanism to keep your eyes open, keep your eyes on the parent that may blow up or the parent that might break down. And you learn to adapt your personality to what is needed in the home. And so I can see that very easily in my child clients. And, you know, it's not just a diagnosis of anxiety. It's all the behaviors and everything that's happening within the home. And then what happens if we don't catch this? What's that consequence right. later? 
Yeah. And consequence later is you're someone who only gets your satisfaction and feeling like people care about you is if you're doing things for them. If you're watching out for them and you're anticipating their needs, this is all people pleaser behavior. And so if you're if you're doing that all the time, you get a little bit of kickback, you get a little bit of feeling like, oh, I remember feeling like, oh, I'm such a good girl. I, I care about everybody. I put myself last. I'm so flexible. I did this all through my marriage. And, and I thought those were wonderful qualities because the society, our society, you know, makes us think that, especially women and girls. And so that's what happens. You get stuck in, in an identity that's not even you not even who you are and you've buried or not even developed who you truly are. Yeah. Really important topic. Oh my goodness. All the people pleasers, raise your hand. I know there's a lot of them out. I know. No more. Um, I know. Yeah. People pleasing no more, but you know, real health consequences later in life, the sooner you can understand this about yourself, the better. Andrea, thank you so much for being here, being in the project. Thank you, Laura. Marie, tell us about your amazing chapter. Hi, yeah. I'm Marie Kalatung, and I wrote chapter 14, and it's called From Living to Thriving, Living After a Stage for Breast Cancer Diagnosis. And I, I felt it was important to share my story, Laura, because I know there are many people out there that need to process, need to kind of come to terms with a very difficult or life-changing diagnosis. And I just wanted to bring that person hope and tell them that there are better days, you'll get through it, and just share a little bit about how I got through that hard time. Marie, I think this is an, an intense mindset practice. What, what did you have to do for yourself for your mindset? Absolutely. Well, where I started basically was, I mean, they're very strong emotions. So I feel like before even getting to shifting the mindset, you almost have to allow yourself to feel those really strong emotions. And a lot of it is ugly, a lot of it is scary, a bit dark, and it's just, but you kind of have to get through those really intense times to actually come to make that shift. And I think, you know, it was just a combination of a lot of things, but I had to really kind of dig deep and kind of find out what my motivation to fight was. <laughs> And I, it didn't, it wasn't very hard to figure out that it was my family, it was my boys and my husband. And so, you know, shifting that mindset is just like, figure out the why, like, why do I like, have to fight through this? And, you know, what motivates me to continue to the next day? And I can go on and on, Laura, about it. But I think that's kind of where I'd start. I'd feel the feels. And then figure out your purpose. Like, what's your purpose for pushing yourself? I love that, Marie. I wrote it down. I had to find my motivation to fight. So for all of you who are trying to find that, you know, ooh, that's that feels really powerful to, Marie, to me. Marie, thank you so much for being here and for being thank in you. the project. Thank you. Casey, tell us about your amazing chapter. Yeah, Laura. So I wrote The Anxious Rhythm of the Muted Black Boy, Curious Confidence, Creating Calm Through Drumming. And there are two points that I, I wanted to address with this. The first point is primary early learning or development of your cognition or way of thinking. And the second part is opening up the door and being transparent about my walk through anxiety and depression and how identifying rhythm and pace and drumming in combination with those things tap into both sides of the brain for a whole lot of physiological health reasons that have existed and just been so monumental in my life. 
I actually thought of you the other day because I was watching a show, a Netflix show, and the gal walks into a therapeutic room with like, you know, like you would take a class and the instructor had, everyone had drumsticks. (laughs) And I thought of you and part of what they were doing on the floor on their yoga mats was actually drumming the floor. And I'm like, I haven't seen that before. I wonder if Casey knows about that. But what is it? What is the therapeutic piece to that? Give us a little window into that. Oh, my gosh. So (laughs) with yoga, it's all kinetics and central nervous system regulation. When you talk about neurotransmitters that fire off and so it's signaling different central nervous systems is what that is usually when you whenever you integrate drumming into yoga right practices so that also depends on the background that has been set externally when you talk about what what the lighting feels like what the lighting looks like what color hue it is of a particular color whether it's a baby blue or a dark blue hue or other things that may exist in the background auditorily. So there's a number of different things. Usually it's channeling more dopamine than anything else. Sometimes it's more norepinephrine, right? Sometimes it's a lot more serotonin of what you want to emulate. And sometimes there's periods of that yoga session to where you want to channel more more of dopamine. So you transition, okay, this is the dopamine session. This is the serotonin period. This is the norepinephrine period. There's so much that could go on there, but yeah, that that's a, those are really cool sessions as well. Well, I love that you're able to sit here and talk about the science behind it. You know, for most people, and in and in that scene, which I loved so much, she is audible. She screams. Yes. And so like, there's that, right, that expression piece of it too. And I'm sure the drumming is part of what can help you release it. Yes. Yes. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 I can't wait for y'all to read more about Casey and what he's up to. Casey, thank you so much for being here and being in the project. Yeah. Thank you. Jessica, tell us about your chapter. Thank you, Laura. Uh, My chapter is chapter 12, Empowered Surrender, Love and Relationships, The Path to Resolve Infertility. And I felt it was important to write this chapter as I'm helping people on their fertility journey. What we notice is we've this, this process, this baby that we think is a right that we should be able to have all of a sudden we thought our whole lives were going to have our career, we're going to have our family, and now that gets taken away from us. And it puts us in a very stressed position where our nervous system, as Casey had said, nervous system regulation is a big component for us as well. So when we look at our autonomic nervous system, our fight or flight response, it's triggered to a level where we're almost frozen with fertility issues. And so what we brought forward with this chapter and what I brought forward with this chapter is how we can be that strong individual. We've done all of this work to have this perfect life. And how can we accept those parts of ourselves, love those parts of ourselves so that we can really truly do the work needed to be able to achieve that pregnancy and that baby? So funny enough, the issue the gal was going through in the scene was fertility. So yeah, kind of, kind of crazy. In case y'all are wondering, this series is called This Is Us. I don't know if some of you all have watched it, but it's a great series. Yes. And the, I have watched very good friends. How do you support that piece is what do you want to say about that? No, that's great. Uh, relationships, that's the one of our top tiers that we look at because usually one partner feels it's their fault. And now we can see that both partners can have an aspect of this. And then we tend to pull away from the other partner as opposed to hold on to them more closely. And so the first thing we need to do is look at ourselves and support ourselves in that. Know that we're worthy of the love of that partner. We're worthy of the love of that baby, of that family, of that dream. So we have to get you down to that level of understanding. And we do that in very simple steps that are attainable for both partners in the relationship. 
Wow, it's, it seems this healing journey that we're on in one way or another moves back to worthiness every single time in almost every discussion that I have. And just such a foundational, profound topic. My goodness, Jessica, thank you so much for being here and for being in the project. So you guys, let's, let's talk a little bit about this, maybe one level deeper. Marie, this is a piece of what I know about the journey. Feeling is healing. And I love that you're starting this question off, Marie, because you said it earlier. You got to go for <laughs> those feeling fully first before you can work on the mindset anyway right feeling yeah. is an awareness practice so helping people to feel is a part of this for me what's your practice of awareness look like in your day-to-day -day? give us a little window into yours yeah you know in some ways like right now in this stage of my life it can be a bit hard uh, just because I am, I'm a um, mother of two busy boys. And so to carve out that time, maybe it's the first thing. And just, you know, just acknowledging that that's really important to do, to make time for yourself to have some quiet. And just to kind of, you have to, you know, carve out that time. It's tough to do that when you're a busy mom. But without doing that, it's it's it, it can be pretty hard just because you're you have so many, you know, balls in the air. What I really resonated with, though, Laura, was the practice of meditation. I had meditated prior to my my healing journey with stage four breast cancer. But I, you know, I kind of learned and practiced. But it's so crazy. I don't know if I really, truly, I don't know. I don't know if I, I, I was doing it as effectively, but I think because I was in just such a state of surrender and searching the practice of meditation after my stage four diagnosis and not only meditation, but prayer, like it just kind of brings you back to your soul being. And I feel like honestly, my, my healing journey just got catapulted after that. Once I figured out how to connect to my soul, be still and listen, I, the, the healing plan and action began. And, you know, that's just what really helped me. And so that's not really, I guess that may be a picture of and every day, you know, you said, you know, what does a day look like for you? I do try to incorporate prayer and meditation, but you know, the first thing is carve out time to do that. So that's <laughs> when typically when the kids are, you know, settled or in bed, um, but that's what works for me. Yeah. Beautiful. And there are many, many forms, you guys. So there are no rules really to starting to meditate. That's something we could talk about for hours today. Find your way. Find a start. And oh my gosh, Marie is so right. You have to carve the time for whatever that piece is. I know I journal. Journal is a meditation time for me. It's a place to focus and put intention and pray and ask and co-create and all the things, right? Um, all right, Casey, you're up next on this one. Can you give us a window to that thing that you're practicing? I was immediately thinking, well, okay, you know, drumming has got to be a piece of the way he practices feeling and awareness, but what else for you? Um, usually first thing in the morning, I wake up i think coffee is kind of a big ritual practice for me and push-ups are really sacred for me like i wake up in the morning and i typically do physical activity so i will do push -up, a push-up routine sit-up routine water and coffee and consciously meditate and do some diaphragmatic breathing during the process of my push-ups is really important for me. The push-ups are great, but doing and adding the diaphragmatic breathing while doing the push-ups 
is glorious. Ooh, I love the combo that you just talked about. I love that. And I, you know, there's also another thing you guys is like, what Casey's talking about are normal morning pieces that he would be doing. Maybe the coffee is just making me think about it, right? So what if your normal moment making that cup of coffee and enjoying it could be the meditation? I mean, what if, right? What could, what if it, it could be those moments and then your physical practice, the breath work, the breath work alone, everybody, it's very accessible and very profound. And I'm sure I know I see the nods because <laughs> I know a lot of us combine things. I love it, Casey. Jessica, how about you? Give us a window into your awareness practice. I'm going to say, start with this is, I'm going to tell you what I do and then some things that I wish I was doing. But I think that even in listening to everyone else, it's so hard to incorporate everything that we should incorporate because everything takes time and we're all so busy. So first thing I do drink a full glass of water. I try to stay away from screens simply because of the impact of screens. And I try to get outside. I do go outside actually every day I'm in Michigan. And so to be up with the sunrise has a certain optimization for your melatonin for tonight's sleep. And that's so very impactful for all of us and to also impact our cortisol cycle, which is our stress hormone. So I always am outside. I always drink a full glass of water. I wait 90 minutes for my coffee. Coffee is my comfort, but I wait 90 minutes because of its uh, positive impact. If we wait 90 minutes on our adenosine receptors, I know we could talk about all of this in so much detail as well. Breath work, I always combine. And I will be very honest. I don't love performing breath work. I love the results from the breath work. So taking care of ourselves and self-care doesn't always mean we love to do it. It just means we have to do it. So box breathing or 6262 breathing, physiologic size where we breathe in deeply, take a little sip extra of air, hold it as long as you can and have the exhale longer than the inhale process. Doing that three times is very beneficial. And that's kind of my cheat if I don't have a lot of time. And something you can do anywhere. So it's yeah. just, it's fabulous to incorporate breath work. Again, a million different ways you y'all can do that. I love these. I love these windows into your guys's uh, mornings. And uh, you all have talked about like that miracle morning, honestly, as well. You set your day up with this energy and intention. It will carry you to bedtime for sure. I love listening to this. Andrea, what's yours? I really do well with present moment awareness throughout the whole day and really checking in with what my body needs, what my body's feeling, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and and really making it a priority to, to address that. Do I need a little bit of rest right now? Do I need some water? Where's the feeling in my body? What do, I'm a little bit anxious. Like, where is that in my body and what can I do? And Often it's in the solar plexus, so I will do diaphragmatic breathing and just have that awareness all day long. I, I've i had a lot of anxiety throughout my whole life, so I've learned that self-care is 24-7 for me and to keep my nervous system regulated and be able to do all the work that I love to do. So it goes with me 24 seven, that, that awareness of, of what I need in the moment. And, I've, and I purposely have made my schedule flexible and, and I have an hour every morning to just hang out and, and feel into my day and feel into what I need. So that's, that's what I do. Yeah. The awareness is everything. And I talk a lot about body awareness too, paying attention to those signs and the sensations and checking in very often. I'm very similar, need to do it every day. Many hours of that day need to keep that up and practiced to keep those levels of anxiety down. Physical exercise is a big one on my list. Sometimes music is another one on my list. Sometimes that's mellow and sometimes that's screaming along with really loud music in the car. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to shift energy, right? Okay, Casey, what's the most important thing you want people to know and understand about mental health? Big question, I know. 
No, it's <laughs> not because I think the most important thing is audaciously doing what rights for you and openly exploring all things, but also being accepting that not all the day fits everything that you need to do. If that, if all of that makes sense. <laughs> I like how you talked about prioritizing it, it for yourself, but, but maybe repeat that second part one more time. What about the day going as you planned? So in your walk through exploring mental health, you will find a ton of things that you think sound cool things you want to explore if you don't have time to do them all in a day don't beat yourself up <laughs> perfect a perfect way to put that and also somebody else said something earlier that made me think about this and we're talking about our tools and our practices and our strategies but the same thing doesn't work for me every morning sometimes you know and so it's good to understand that with Andrea's talking about being in the moment, paying attention to the message, it may be something totally different that you reach for, right? And definitely don't beat yourself up if you don't have the time, but just listening in and, and choosing is really good. Jessica, what's the most important thing you want people to understand about mental health? There are so many. How do you pick one? I think along the same vein as, as Casey's, it's grace. Giving yourself grace. It's okay to feel this way. It's okay to feel this way. So when we're struggling with a moment to not fight our, try to fight our way out of it, because we don't get out of it by trying to say we're okay. We don't get out of it by pretending we're okay. We do best if we allow ourselves the grace to feel how we're feeling. Personally, I feel when I'm feeling off, I feel where is it in my body? I take that moment, as Andrea said as well, of just checking in in this exact moment, being right where I am at this moment and allowing myself to breathe into that space and allow myself to feel. And then that can dissipate slowly. I think that's most, most important. No, it's okay. Andrea, how about you? What do you want people to understand? What what matters to you on this topic the most? So many things. I want people to know they're allowed to feel and they deserve to feel vibrant and healthy and creative. That's our natural state and everybody deserves it. There's so many ways to get there and so much help. And I, and I I feel it's so important to to understand, to do some research, to understand how your brain works and how your feelings work and, and who you are. Are you a sensitive person? Are you intuitive? Are you empathic? Certain types of people need different ways of, and, and thinking doesn't solve much of anything is what I want people to know is that you got to feel it. You got to get into the feelings and, and it can be tough. It can just feel rough to go through that. And those of us who love to grow, diving in at the first one, something's resolved and we feel better and the next one comes, but that's the process and being up for it and, and know that, that it's your right to grow and, and you can do that. Everyone can do it. I was uh, having a chat with my kids about being empathic and I was just kind of smiling and chuckling to myself and they're in their twenties, they're adults, but it would be, it would have been cool to have someone to talk to about what was happening in my twenties. And I, so I'm seeing their sensitivity and that, that they're both empaths and you know i went to one of them the other day i'm like do you even know what that means like do we you know should we do we need to talk about this it was a great conversation actually marie how about you what's that thing you want people to know about mental health yeah what comes to mind for me and i talk a little bit about this in my chapter is just knowing that mental health actually has a strong tie to your physical health, like it's, and, and then there's other pillars of health, but 
when we talk about mental health, like it's really important just to know that there's a really strong direct relationship between mental health and how you're taking care of that. Like, are you keeping that in check and making sure that you're, you know, living life with gratitude and, you know, where's your mindset? Is it a negativity mindset or is it, you know, one of like hope and positivity and excitement? And I don't mean to simplify things, but I think, you know, when you ask the question, that's, that's what I think about is just recognizing that there's a really strong tie between mental health and, and your physical well-being. And, you know, I, I talk about my journey and I realized that because I wasn't taking care, among other things, I wasn't really looking at my mental health prior to my diagnosis. I wasn't maybe honoring it. It contributed a lot to my dis-ease. And I talk a little bit about dis-ease or my disease. So yeah, just recognizing that there is a tie to mental health and, and health overall. And hence the title of the book, you guys, Holistic Mental Health and Understanding the Connections. So it's the thing I love the most about partnering with Laura for this topic is looking at it from, for those ties that Marie's talking about, those links, those connections, the integration, right? All right. This is last question for all of you. Jessica is going to go first. So some moments, I think that community was what was the difference between success and failure in terms of my own mental health. It, It meant a lot to me. It still means a lot to me. And I've learned to define this on my own over the years. My it could mean one person. It doesn't have to, when you have that vision in your mind, you know, it doesn't have to be a big community, (laughs) but community has made the difference. Tell me about your community and what that's meant for you. Oh, this is a wonderful question. And community, we have found even in study that inflammation, inflammatory factors in our bodies can decrease when we are in community. When you look at blue zones, areas around the globe where people live beyond the age of 100, community is a major factor. When we have community and we have that likeness of mind, and this was actually studied studied in animal models too, and also with their stress hormones that they come down and then optimize our mental health. This is very, very important and impactful for all of us. We do, uh, we're all community in our programs and it's so helpful to see and share, I'm not alone because isolation causes those hormones and our physiology to be completely dysfunctional and then impact that health, just as Marie was speaking of, about our mental health being impactful on our physical health. So community is absolutely imperative. I'm pretty sure the blue zone thing is another Netflix special that y'all should watch, <laughs> right? Some, some of you have watched that. Gosh, I love those episodes. And what a cool way to start this question off. Thank you is talking about that science of it. It yeah. is a big deal, right? It is. Yeah, it's exciting to me. And, and it also is full of hope energy for me to talk about it. And I hope you, you listeners are feeling it right. Just breathe in the, the high vibes of that for a minute. Andrea, what about you? Tell me about your community and what that's meant for you. It means everything. I mean, to find someone who gets you and just, even if it's one person, like you said, say, Oh my God, I'm not crazy. You know, I, you get validated, you get, I, they see it your way, maybe in a different, a different light. Cause they're not you, but that feeling is so wonderful. And I hope I do that for my clients as part of their community of wellness practitioners and really validate where they're at. And, and that's, that's something we can all learn to do for each other to really look it's, it's all about the listening and, and caring. There's so much depth to community that 
that we could cultivate more of, you know, this rushing society and, and we don't have time. And, you know, I see moms and kids, so I've got moms who, you know, can barely make the appointments, let alone have time to go, go see their friends and, and hang out. I think we also have to be really careful that we're not hanging out with friends. I mean, of course, we we there's all kinds of ways to hang out, but there's ways that are actually cause stress in sort of a competitive community or, or something where it, you don't feel right. So I, I guess I'm saying listening to the resonance and the feeling that you feel when you're with people is so important because a lot of us are stuck in wrong communities, communities that that are not helpful. So that's another part to be really aware of because sometimes people just don't know how good it can feel to be listened to and validated and and to find those people and and hold on to them. That's a really important um, point. So you all can assess the ones you're in and you can ask yourself the question, when I leave here, am I lifted up? Am I vibing a little higher and is this helping me feel like a better person healthier all the way around right and sometimes it can be a little in your face that that's a no <laughs> and and you have to just pause I, I love that you brought that up that's a game life changer when you can you can curate your community in a way that improves your own mind, body, soul, spirit, health, right? Really, really important. Marie, how about for you? What's it, what's community meant for you? My gosh, it's just, it has been profound for me, especially after my diagnosis. I, I'm so glad you asked the question because it just makes me think back to how much I appreciate my, the support that I received from family and friends and after hearing about my stage four diagnosis, I was I was just incredibly devastated, I guess you can say. But you know what helped to pull me through that darkness was just friends and family telling me that they loved me. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it was just it was very powerful. And it just it it was it like infused my strength just to hear that I was loved that people believed in me. And it was just like I was embraced by my family's family and friends. And funnily enough, I made friends after my stage four diagnosis, like from they were just coming into my life and embracing me and other stage four thrivers and survivors telling me that they believed in me. So community is so so very important. But I think what Andrea said is is very important to remember too. Maybe the big group or maybe the big network is not your thing. But if it's one person that you can confide in and that you feel safe with, just kind of lean on that person too. And that, that can be your community as well. So yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it. Thank you, Marie. All right, Casey, you're going to close us out on this question today. What's that meant for you? Hmm. So community for me is, is a combination of three words. It's people, places, and things. And diving in that into that a little bit further is when you set goals, right, for your life, whether they be professionally, or leisurely, or socially, small goals, big goals, short-term goals, long-term goals, whichever, right? I think it is always important to understand and identify what people, what places, and what things fit the description of not getting to those goals, and be really quick in discernment to decide what those people look like so that you can avoid people, avoid places and avoid things that don't get you there so that you can create room or capacity to be in the places that you deserve and desire per your goal. 
Oh my goodness. You're giving us like a, a mini life coaching lesson right now. Y'all listening to this, like this is important stuff. <laughs> this is going to change things. And, and sometimes we haven't given ourselves enough time to pause and ask these kinds of questions about who we've been hanging out with and where we're going. And I know there was a point in my life where I, I wasn't even sure. I, I hadn't given myself the time to ask, what do you want? We run around following what we were taught we should want instead of asking at that in that deeper way. I love, love, love that you brought that up. That's important for everybody to understand. Community for me, humongous shout out today to the Brave Healer community for not only for to all of you for being such badasses in terms of showing up in the world, taking responsibility for your energy and how you're showing up as this aware, being, conscious, caring, compassionate, you four <laughs> are that. And all of the authors in the holistic mental health book are that. The Brave Healer community for me is that. And I am so grateful to be playing in that playground every day with all of you. You're amazing human beings. Jessica, Andrea, Casey, and Marie, thank you so much for what you do in the world. And thank you for being here today to share it with everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. So for our listeners today, remember that this is way more than a book. It is a generous community of these people who signed up to lead and guide your journey drop down into the show notes because they're all hooked up with their links go explore what they're up to learn more about the programs they talked about today all of the topics they are there for you to reach out and ask a question get support whatever it is that you're doing on your journey you're not alone and you can also join us for the book launch party. We're going to have that April 18th, 7.15 p.m. Eastern information down below for the Zoom for that. We're going to have the whole author cast of Holistic Mental Health Volume 2 with us. We're going to be doing some fun giveaways. We're going to have a lot of fun in our book launch party. So drop down below, get the Zoom. And if you happen to be listening to this interview anytime after that date, that just means you can hop over to Amazon and grab your copy of the book. Lastly today, everyone remember, your words change the world when you're brave enough to share them. So it's time to be brave. See you next time, everyone.